Okay, uh, so practical static analysis. The one-liner for this is that appropriate application of static analysis will reduce the overall cost of software development. So hopefully, by the end of this, if you don't already believe it from Mob's talk, hopefully you'll definitely believe it by the end of my talk. Um, and this is why I think static analysis is an important part of software development and why it should be added to your, to your toolkit. And why will static analysis uh, reduce the overall cost of software development? Well, if we think how much a bug costs, generally, the later we find a bug, the more it costs. So static analysis helps us take bugs from potentially when the software is out in production and moves it to perhaps prevents us from even, in some cases, adding the defect in in the first place. In the first place. So our agenda for today, we're going to look at what static analysis is. We're going to look at some basic static analysis. Then we're going to look at more advanced static analysis, which was the kind of stuff that Rob was talking about. And then we'll look at some tips for adding this in practice to your projects. So hopefully by the end of this, you can take away some practical things you can actually do tomorrow when you next code. So let's look at what static analysis, that analysis is. Uh, static analysis is looking at the code and reasoning about it to find potential problems. So we can do some static analysis now. I'm going to ask you, do we think this code is correct? So if we look at it, we're assigning um, integer value 1 to a. We're calling the function process, passing in $a, so passing uh, value 1. And we're passing it to users. So as far as we've seen here, we'd have to delve into the process uh, function to determine if, a, if an integer is the correct thing to pass as user. But looking at this code here, we can't say for sure that there's anything wrong with it. But what about this code? So again, we've assigned a the integer value 1. We're calling process passing that integer value 1. And we can see that the function process in this case is expecting something of type user. So we know that this code will, will never work. If we ran this code as is and it hit this line of code, something you would get a, a fatal error. So static analysis tells us that our code is incorrect. Let's think about testing now. Imagine we've got some relatively simple code here. Uh, it's trying to get the price of something. We're turning an integer. We're passing in a string, which is the type. If its type is child, we set the price to 10. If the type is adult, we set the price to 20. And then we return price. So taking that code as it is written there, if we applied these test cases, where I put an input of 10, expected, sorry, input of child, our expected value is 10, and a second test where the input value is adult and our expected output is 20. Um, if we look at this code, all our tests would pass if we gave them those test cases. And we would have had 100% code coverage as well. Every single line would have been executed. Every if statement, you would have got both the true and the false versions of it. So tests tell us for the particular scenario we tested that everything is correct. So we know when we give it child, it works correctly. And when we give it adult, it works correctly. But what would static analysis make of that? Static analysis would complain here. And it's saying we're possibly returning an undefined variable, because there is a chance that we haven't set price at all. And you know, we're expecting an int. And so there's a chance that we would not be returning something that's an integer. So static analysis tells us that our code is incorrect. It's nagging us. You made a mistake. You made a mistake. Whereas tests tell us for the scenarios we have written tests for that everything is working correctly. So let's look at some what I'm calling basic static analysis tools. The simplest type of tools we can use are linting. Um, so that will be looking at your code and checking it can even be inter or compiled or interpreted. Uh, so, for example, if you're missing a semicolon or a closing brace, then that would be something that a linter would find. Uh, so the linting, linting tool I use is Parallel Lint. Um, if you want to add this to your project, if it, so is anyone not using Parallel Lint on their project? Was, okay. Or if you, if, are you using something similar? If you're not using something similar, if you don't have a linting thing in here, 
I'd recommend starting off by adding this. Uh, so that's how you add it. You require it, and then you run it. You just call parallel ints, and you give it the directories where your code that you want um, linting should go. In reality, if you're using tools like PHP Storm, very rarely should this find anything. This PHP Storm will probably tell you you've made a mistake. Slightly more advanced now, coding standards. Um, there's a PHP CS Fixer, uh, which I use. Uh, there's Code Sniffer. And these tools look at your code, and they can make sure that you're complying with, for example, PSR standards. Um, they can be a bit more advanced than, than that as well. So what I'd recommend is if you haven't already got some kind of a style checker in there or coding standards checker, I would add this in because this, this is the kind of thing that can just look at your code and say, look, you, you haven't, you, you're not following the correct conventions, and you don't really want a human doing that. It's much quicker and more efficient for uh, a coding standards tool to do that. Often these tools, oh, and for a lot of these rules, these tools have, they're safe to make fixes to. So if, for example, you um, have a format for your, your, you know, where your, your method functions, it can say, I'm expecting them to all to be in one line, but if it's longer than line, I'm expecting one uh, parameter per line of code. And that's a fix that if your code doesn't comply with that standard, it can just go and automatically fix it. Though it's not, you're not changing anything about the code. So these tools both have auto-fix uh, things as well. Another thing to consider from static analysis is uh, security checking. So Sensio Labs uh, have a tool which looks at your composer.lock file, and then it checks those against uh, a list of um, raised issues, and it says if you're using a package that has a CVE uh, against it. And this is the kind of thing you want to run this on a regular basis, maybe every day, every month, because even if you stop developing on code, it could turn out that in the future, somebody finds a, a bug with the package that you're, you're using. Um, other checks, I definitely recommend having the composer validate um, added to part of something you run um, on a regular basis. That stops your composer JSON and your composer lock accidentally getting checked in out of step with each other. Uh, and another useful tool is Vardamp Checker to make sure you haven't left any kind of uh, sloppy debugging uh, in, your, in your code. And there's this, this um, page here. The, if you just Google static analysis tools, PHP static analysis tools, this, this will almost definitely be the top link. And there are probably hundreds of tools in there. And what I'd recommend is every project start with the basic one and just try and add in a new static analysis tool with each new project or every six months or so. If you're using Symfony, there are additional linting for Twig and for YAML and for Doctrine. Uh, and I think in Symfony 5, they've even introduced a container lint as well. So if you're using Symfony, look for these things. If you're using another framework, they probably have similar kind of linting tools, which you should add into part of your um, static analysis. So one way. Uh, you can add all these in, is actually in Composer. So Composer has the ability, uh, this Composer scripts functionality, and what you can do is you can create your own, essentially, Composer um, instruction. In this case, I've called it CI, and you can list all of the steps that you want it to take. And, and the great thing about doing this is every time you want to run all your static analysis tools, you just type Composer run scripts CI, and it will run them all and then you can keep adding more and more tools to it. The other tool I'd definitely add in is a CS fix. So for example, if you're using something uh, like any of the uh, coding standards tools, you'll want to run the automated fixes before you commit the code. So I also have uh, a CS fix, and then that will just call whatever it needs to call to, to fix. And it doesn't really matter what tools you're using, as long as you've just got this composer run script CS fix, it will automatically do what it can. Now, I'm not going to talk about CI now, um, but what I want to say is all the things we've seen so far, all the basic CI, if I wanted to run that on Circle CI, I can just do it in you know, 16, 17 lines of code. So if anyone doesn't have CI set up, then the first thing I'd recommend when you're going to work, the next day you're working, or when you're on an open source project, is set something up like this. So you can use the Composer scripts, 
to add in the tools that you want. And you can use all the basic tools I've already mentioned and whatever additional ones you want to put in. And you should be able to get something going on CircleCI relatively quickly. There's an example uh, repo there. It's a bit out of date, but you know, it should be enough to get you going. Um, and CircleCI, I think they give you 250 build minutes free every week. And if you're just doing the simple kind of tools that I'm talking about, you'd have to do a lot of builds before you even hit that limit. And if you are hitting that limit, you definitely should be paying for it. There are other tools as well as CircleCI as well. So it's so simple to get these tools going. If you haven't got it going, make it your New Year's resolution to add those things in. And the benefit of putting these in CI is essentially, if we think about a cost of bug, really we're kind of pulling it down to you know, when you're sending it off to, the, to, to, to um, your CI. So every time you're doing a commit and pushing it up to GitHub or wherever, and it's running the CI, that is the point it will tell you about issues. But we can do better than that. Um, we can use real-time static analysis tools. I always hesitate whether this slide is necessary. Is anyone, or well, who's using a tool like PHP Storm or equivalents? Okay, so not everyone. So some people might be using text editors or simpler tools, and those tools are missing some real-time static analysis. So what we really want from our tools that we're developing code in is something that can understand the entire code base and highlight errors as we're writing them in real time. And it, some of them can even suggest an autocomplete based on context, so you never even put the wrong code in in the first place. And you also want a tool that can help you with refactoring. So if we look at, this is our earlier example in PHP Storm, you can see immediately it's telling you you've made an error. So you don't even have to wait till CI runs or your test runs to tell you there's a problem. As you're typing it, it can tell you you've made a mistake. And in reality, in a lot of cases, it just tells you the possible correct options. So if you use these real-time static analysis tools, it prevents you from making mistakes in the first place. It just tells you, you know, in terms of static analysis, what is, what is right. You might be doing complete garbage, but that's your test that will you know, tell you that. So if we think about CI and then we contrast that with real-time static analysis, tools like PHP Storm, it can actually bring bugs right down here, preventing bugs right down here when you're, when you're writing the code. Um, if you're, oh, by the way, I have no association with PHP Storm. I just use it and I, I, th I think it's good. Um, if you're struggling to find the value of, of PHP Storm, then you can download it and try it for free for a month. When that month is up, you can go into the help section, uh, you can go into the productivity guide, and it tells you things like, it's saving me typing 1,300 characters per day, it's found 7,483 possible bugs, or 12 per working day. And you'll probably find you can associate a value with that bug, and it will be way more than the cost of a PHP Storm license. So I was kind of at this stage where I was using PHP Storm to do a lot of advanced static analysis, preventing bugs happening. I was using CircleCI to do a lot of the basic static analysis and preventing bugs happening. And what I really wanted was a lot of the advanced static analysis that PHP Storm was doing in real time, I wanted that in part of my CI, just in case I made some changes and I didn't realize there were some issues that PHP Storm were highlighting. So this is when we're going to start talking um, about more advanced tools. So this is what I had, but I didn't have the real-time static analysis things. And uh, maybe about three or four years ago, I went to a talk, maybe, maybe three years ago, I went to a talk, and Rasmus was talking about the tool fan. And I thought, that is exactly the tool uh, that I'm looking for. And it turned out, there's, as you already know, there's Sarm and there's PHP Stan. Um, now, PHP Stan and Sarm have these online playgrounds. So if you want to try some tools out, you can go to uh, sarm.dev, for example. You can type in some code, and it tells you almost in real time what the issues are that it would have found. So if you want to try these things out, you can do it, and, and PHP Stan has a similar kind of online playground, which is really useful, especially um, if you've got little snippets of code because you can get a link to it, the code, and then you can ask people, uh, why is this working or whatever? Why isn't this working? 
Another common concept that all these tools have is the concept of levels. So you have a very strict level and then a less strict level. Um, these are the ones, in fact, in fact PHP stand now goes up to level eight. Uh, the reason PHP st and starts at zero and gets, it, it starts at seven, but it, as, as more and more rules, they can become more and more stricter, so it can increment the highest level. Um, I think it also has a minus minus max level when you're setting them up, which will pick uh, the, the highest, um, the strictest thing, if that's, if that's what you want. So to get the best out of these tools, you need to provide as much type hint information as, as possible. So the reason we know that this is a bug is because we've done a type hint on the, on the function process. And this is fine. Um, the PHP typing system gives a lot of ability to do these things, but there's a whole area that's missing. And this area is called generics. Um, so imagine we've got this, this code here, and here we are iterating through, um, we're calling um, get employees, and we're iterating through each of the uh, employees that it comes back. And we can see that get employees returns an array. We've done everything possible at language level. You can't say what is in that array. But we can say that we expect get employees to return an array. So the problem is we don't actually know what type employee is, because we don't know what's in that array. So when we call process, we're passing something of which type we don't know um, to the promote method. And the promote method is saying, I'm expecting something of type employee. But we don't have the information here to assert that, that is really the case. So what we can do is we can add uh, this extra doc lock in here on the uh, get employees method. And what this is saying is I'm returning um, something uh, you can iterate over where all the values in that, in that thing you're returning is of type employee. So you've got this employee in the open and close square brackets. That's a common convention within PHP. The language doesn't understand it, but it's a pretty common convention used uh, everywhere. Now, our static analysis tools, all the three I mentioned, also understand this. So they know um, that employee is therefore something of object type employee. So when we're calling promote, we know that the thing we're passing to it really is an employee. And not only that, if in the get employees method, you try and put something, you try and return an array where it can work out that one of the values isn't of type employee, it will complain and tell you you've made a mistake. So that's great. Um, and the other good thing about this is that uh, our real-time static analysis tools understand this as well. So PHP, um, PHP Storm knows what this means, and you can see that it, it's telling you here that it knows that employee is of the object type employee. So that's basic generics, and that will probably cover probably 60-70% of what you need to do. How about this code that we've modified slightly? So now we're iterating through what we get from the, what is returned from the get employees method. And this time we're interested in both the key and the value. So we're getting the name, which is the key in the array, and the value is the employee. And then we're calling the welcome method and passing to it name, which is the, the key of the array. And we can see that the welcome uh, function is expecting something of type string. So if we put this code into um, PHP, into, into Psalm, excuse me, into Psalm, it would complain about this. It's saying, I don't understand, it's saying, I don't understand, I don't know for sure what type name is. But that's a bit of an old, but it would tell you something slightly different, but it would still complain about this. So how do we get around that? Well, what we can use is this, this convention up here, return array where we, we've got these angle brackets and the first thing we say is the type of the key and the second thing is the type of the value. So we're returning an array where the keys are strings and the values are um, objects of type employee. And once again, um, Sam and PHP Stan understand, uh, understand this. And if you try and create an array where the keys are integers, it will, it will tell you, you you made a mistake or indeed anything other than the strings. So that means we now know that name 
is of type string. Um, so when we're calling welcome, we know the thing we're calling it with is of type string. So we, we know that this is all OK. There is a problem, though. Uh, at the moment, my IDE of choice doesn't understand what this means. And in fact, not only does it not understand what the, the type of the key is, it now doesn't understand what the type of the array value is. So it doesn't know that employee is of type employee. And hopefully one day um, they'll fix this. But this is a bit of a problem. And if I had the choice, I'd probably rather take the real time static analysis over the deferred static analysis um, running on CI. But we don't actually have to worry about this. Because what we can do is we can, um, we can give two annotations for our function get employees. The first one is the one that we probably all know and recognize, and uh, PHP Storm understands. So this is saying, I'm returning something um, where the array, all the values in the array are type employee. And I can do SAM return and say that it gives it the additional information that SAM understands. So what SAM will do is it will throw away the first one and goes, this is what I understand. But PHP Storm and the other tools will look at the at return document. And actually, um, recently, PHP Stan have also introduced things where they say at PHP Stan dash, dash return. And I think both tools understand each other's annotations because there is no standard yet. So other common concepts between them, as we've seen, you can do, you can annotate things with var, pram, and return. And in, in SAM, you've got SAM var, SAM pram, and SAM return. FAN has these, and, and, and now, as of uh, a couple of months ago, so does uh, PHP STAN. There's other common tools. Uh, there's also other commonalities between all of these. You've got the levels which we talked about. You can annotate code to say, um, I don't want to see issues of a certain type. The config files in all of them, you can be very specific about saying, I don't want to see rules of certain types or ignore these directories. Um, so there's a lot of configuration you can do uh, if you need to. So those are the common things. What I'm going to do now is look at getting started with, with SARM. What I say here is equally applicable to, to the others. There's just slight differences between them. As we've seen in the previous talk, this is, this is how you install um, SARM. Uh, you create your config file, uh, and then you run it. And in reality, when you first see the results, you'll, you'll probably cry, especially if you have it on a, on a high level. This was some code that I was working in, not a huge um, code base. Uh, and eight is its least strict level in, in SARM. And as you can see, one is its most strict level, and it found some like one and a half thousand uh, issues um, at that. And you kind of look at these bugs, and it kind of got me thinking, well, what really is a bug? You know, these issues that it's finding. Um, I think the first one is genuine bugs. These are things that if you executed the code as it stood, it would crash. Then we've got what I'm calling deferred bugs. So we'll look at those in a bit. Evolvability defects and false positives. So let's have a look at each of these things. So this is a real bug. This is the example from earlier. If we executed that code, this would crash. We don't want that to happen. What I'm calling a deferred bug is the other code we looked at before. So what happens when we find code like this is we often have discussions with people. And I say, well, there's a potential bug here. And sometimes people might say, well, I've checked all the possible places where we call get price, and I can tell you that we only ever call it with the strings child and the strings adults. So it's not really a bug. And the response to that is, do we know from this time till the time that that code is decommissioned, we will never, ever, ever call this function get price with something other than child or adult? And the reality of it is, it's probably quicker to fix this than to risk it. So these are deferred bugs. The next type is evolvability defects. And this is code that makes the code base less compliant with standards, more error prone, or more difficult to modify, extend, or understand. So it's a posh word, I suppose, for technical debt. And this is important. And people have done studies on this, which I have referenced. And they are available um, in references at the end of this talk. 
Um, so evolvability, uh, evolvability defects account for 80% of bugs found during code review. So this is stuff that just makes the code more difficult to understand. And it just means that our future selves or other developers will make mistakes because of it. And people have done surveys on it on how low, um, low evolvability costs money, new features take 28% longer to implement, and fixing bugs took 36% longer. So there are real business costs associated with, with poor quality or difficult to understand code. Uh, so here's an example of an evolvability bug that um, it found. We've kind of got something going funny on here. We're saying we're returning an int, but we're kind of returning a string that looks like age next birthday is uh, $A, whatever that is, as I, and then plus one. So these are kind of evolvability effects. That code's obviously working, but it's pretty confusing if someone had to look at it later. And then the final type is false positives. But often with false positives, you can rewrite your code in such a way that those aren't there, those false positives aren't there. And the benefit of that is not only will the static analyzer not complain, but often the way you remove the false positives makes it clearer to the developers as well. So what are these bugs? Well, a bug is definitely a bug. And I would argue that these two are also issues that we would hope to... Um, uh, correct as well, and maybe even look at the false positives. It depends on the false positives. Uh, so some real bugs when I ran it. Um, here we've uh, got this uh, method called get email address. We can see it's returning something of type string. Um, we're returning the email object, and we're pulling the email out of some array. We are checking that email isn't empty. And if it is empty, we throw uh, an import exception. So this, this was something that was uh, going through uh, a YAML file and pulling out the data from there. But the YAML file was from an untrusted source. So there's every possibility that, um, although we check that email does exist and has a value, there is a chance. Well, actually, we don't even check email. I mean, if the, you might not even have um, something with key email. But if you did and it was empty, then we, we, we see that there's an exception thrown. But we haven't done any type checking here to make sure that email genuinely is of type string. So there's, there's some validation missing here. And one day that will, that will definitely trip us up. In fact, it, it did trip us up. Then we've got this uh, deferred bug here. Again, this is code that's working. We can see here we are calling create search term and we're passing it to postcode and location get slug. We can see that the function requires a postcode, which is a value object of postcode and a string slug. Um, so we get the string from location called get slug, but we see here that get slug is returning either a string or a null. So there is some possibility potentially that slug will be null and then when we call get location get slug, uh, and we're calling create search term, create search terms expecting something as a string. If a null comes in, then this will crash. So there's something odd going on here. And actually, what I'd have to do is I'd have to go back and work out how we ever got the stuff into locations. It's quite a thorny problem to, to work out. And of course, if I was running static analysis from the start, I would have seen that issue immediately, and it probably would have been much easier to fix. So an evolvability defect, uh, what potentially is wrong with this code here? Or how could we make it more readable? What is missing is we haven't given a return type for the anonymous function. In fact, I learned that you could give return types for anonymous functions when this came up in, in static analysis. Um, <clears throat> so it's useful. So, uh, of course, you don't really made me to fix all these bugs. Um, here, here are some tips. So we're going to look at the more practical side of, of introducing static analysis into our code base. The first thing is I would target our most strict static analysis at our business logic. So hopefully we have developed our code in such a way that we have the business logic is kind of decoupled from the framework and it's just pretty simple vanilla PHP code. And then it sits in terms of framework, which is probably doing lots of magic, which is a lot more difficult for static analysis tools to reason about. So we want to be super strict about our business logic and maybe less strict about framework stuff. 
Other problems we have is when we integrate with third-party libraries. So the third-party libraries might have been written at a time before the static analysis tools were, were as mainstream as they are now. Um, so there was one tool, it's a really great tool, it's uh, a hashing tool, so you give it uh, like an ID, an integer, and it will return a hash and it always gives the same hash back. So it's, it's quite handy on web pages, you know, if you were, if you sort of said person and it's, it, it, rather than using the actual person's, you know, ID from the database, you can hash it and then people can't guess what other people's IDs are. Um, now, if we look at this, uh, when you call Hasher, you pass to it an ID. But if we look at the uh, signature for the method, it doesn't look like it accepts any, any parameters. So a static analysis tool will, will say, well, hang on a minute, something doesn't look right here. You're passing something which I'm not expecting it. So what you could do is you could write an adapter for this third-party library. So we've got my class clean Hasher. Um, we inject in the actual hasher that we're using, um, and then we've got our encode method, and in this case, we always called it with just one integer value, so we, we're saying I'm expecting it only to pass in with one integer value. Then we call the actual underlying hasher, and then this would be something where we'd have to say, no, this is a, this is a false positive, this is genuinely correct. But everywhere else in the code, we're saying I'm expecting it, something of integer type, and it will, it will know, therefore, that this, this is all okay. Arguably, you should be doing that with your third-party libraries anyway, in case you want to make it easy to test or in the case there's a reason you have to switch them all out. But anyway, that is one solution uh, for dealing with third-party libraries. Uh, further um, static analysis tips. We can see here that um, we have a function called, uh, we've got an object of type foo, and we've got, uh, also got an object of type foo, and then we've got some kind of dependency injector container, and what you do is you say, I want you to make something, and you pass in the name of the object that you want it to make, and it goes and builds it, and it returns it. Now, we've no way of knowing what we're going to, you know, this could build anything. This could build foos, it could build people, it could build um, anything. So we can't really say, we don't know here what type we're actually returning. And how we'd use it is we say, dependency injection container, make me something of type foo. And we know that dollar foo is of type foo. So we know when we call foo, say hello, we know it's calling that, that method there. And the thing is, a static anal analyzer will have no idea what's going on here. Maybe humans will have no idea what's going on here either. So what we can do is we can start adding in uh, additional information here. Um, oops, sorry. So what we are, ah uh, yes. So what we can do, the first thing we can do is we can put type ints in our code. So we can say, I know that this is building something of type foo. So I know that this, this variable foo is of type foo. And, Static analyzers and PHP Storm will understand this and it will assume that foo is of type the object foo. Um, and then maybe this is uh, how we build it. So we're saying this is, I want you to make this thing called my app foo. Um, and what we can do is we can say here, I'm expecting, we can give additional information about what we're expecting to be passed in. So what we're saying is this string isn't any old string. It is a string that represents the name of a class. So here we're saying some pram. So we've got the pram string class name because we're passing in something in string. But what we're saying here is we're expecting this thing to be a type class name. So that means if we uh, put in something for an object that didn't exist, some will look at this and go, I know that if, if it can work it out at um, when it's analyzing the code, it will pick that up as an issue. So this is, um, so here, if we pass in, so there's another problem now, is if we pass in bar, and saying that I want you to build a bar, but we're saying that foo is actually of type foo, what the static analyzer understands and what's actually going on are two different things. So you're going to start getting false positives or you might be missing issues. So there's a way we get around this. We can, we can tell the static analyzer even more information about, about how it understands this. 
So what we can do here is we can say that our dependency injection container, we've got this thing called template T. And what we can say is the type of, temp the type of T we can derive from the class name. And we've already said up here that the class name, the string class name, must be something that represents a class. And then finally, we're returning something of type T. So what that means is if we ask, uh, if we call to make and say, I want you to make something of foo colon colon class, um, Sam will say, is foo colon colon class actually a class I know about? And if it is, it will say, I know that the thing I'm returning is something of type foo. And then you can get rid of all those other bits of information and it, it will, it will, um, it knows what's going on, and there can be no mismatch between the static analyzer's understanding of the code and what's actually going on. So there's other things we can do. Um, uh, imagine we've got some code like this. Uh, we've got a login command, we instantiate the command, we call execute, and then after we've executed, we, we get something about it, like the access token. So the way we'd expect this to run is we'd call login command and we then call get access token. The pro sorry, if we call login command and we don't call execute, then when we call get access token, it hasn't done whatever it needs to do. So the correct way of calling this is saying, I've got my login command, I'm passing off something to execute it, and then I can, I can do whatever I need to do to get the access token. So we might say we've got our access tokens of type string, although in PHP 7.4 we can actually put string in there. Um, and then we know that access token should be of type string, but when we instantiate this object, it could be zero, because access token doesn't, ha doesn't get set until the execution phase. We need to say that in reality, um, access token could be string or null. And some will complain if you do not give, if you say something as a type string and you do not in the constructor make it a type string, uh, give it a value, it will, it will complain about it. I haven't done any PHP 7.4, so it might behave slightly differently now. And the problem is we then call get access token here and we're saying access token, you know, the member data access token could be of either type string or it could be null, but we are saying that I, I'm going to guarantee I always return something of type string. So here we've got the possibility of returning a null value. And the way that would really happen is if you, if you created your, your login command and you didn't call execute before you called um, get access token. But what we can say is we can say, well, actually, the way this should be used, we should never call get access token unless we've called execute method. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some additional logic in here to say if access token is null, then I'm going to throw a logic exception. This should never happen. And then at that point, the static analysis tools are clever enough to know, well, that could have been null, but by here, it has to be a string. So I know that's not an issue. And we might find ourselves doing a lot of that in code. So we might write ourselves a little assertion method assert, and called assert not null. Uh, you pass it a value and you give it a message and if it happens that access token is null, it will throw an exception. And actually, uh, so the implementation of this uh, could be something like this, static method not null. Um, if the expression is null, then it throws an exception. And actually, SARM is clever enough to understand what's going on there. So it will know that there's no way, um, if we come back to here, it knows there's no way beyond this, um, that it knows this will not return if what you've passed in is null. So it's clever enough to go down one level. And at the time I wrote the slides, and I think this is still the case now, let's look at our cert methods. We're gonna have lots of assertions like this, and let's say we just refactor that. So we have our function at cert not null, and this, calls self assert true, and then um, the assert true says, well, if this isn't true, then I'm going to throw a logic exception. And then you'd have loads of other assertions, you know, assert null, assert whatever, uh, integer. And it just makes it uh, a lot simpler. The problem is, um, the problem is that if that is how we've written our assertion libraries, if we call our assert true here, we 
have to give some more information because it doesn't know that not null, it, it, you know, it can't do two jumps, if that makes sense. So we have to give some additional information and we can do it in terms of this annotation here. And what this means is that we're telling Psalm that if you call this method not null and the thing is not, is, it will only continue if, if what you're giving if the expression is not null. So if you give it a null thing, then Psalm knows that assertion has failed, so it knows that this method won't return. Don't know if that made sense. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so what you'll probably find in your code, certainly if you use assertion libraries, is you have to give them, you have to give some more information about this. In reality, you wouldn't write your own assertion libraries because there's lots of great assertion libraries that already exist. So if we're already using an assertion library and that library doesn't have this information that Psalm understands in it, then we have to tell Psalm how about that information. So what you can do is you can use these things called stubs. So imagine we have this third party library. Again, Web Mozart have actually added in all these assertions, but there was a stage when they didn't have them all in. So we could say, I'm using Web Mozart's assert library. And what you would do is you just give it the class and the method signatures. So what Psalm would do is it would say, every time I see the method not null, the static method not null, called on the class assert in the name of space web assert, I will additionally attach this information to it. So that is really useful for when you are using third-party libraries which do not have enough information for static analysis tools to understand them. And some third-party libraries like Web Mozart are adding in these SAM assertions, others are not. And I can understand why they wouldn't, because they say, why have I got some random you know, thing here you know, that's not part of the language or isn't part of a PSR? Um, you tell uh, Psalm about your stubs, um, in, you go into the config, and you just give it a list for every, every single stub file you've got. And you can use any of the Psalm annotations we, we've, we've discussed in there. So you could you know, tell it about your dependency injection container, um, which I've done on some other projects that I've used on. So the key thing is when you're running these tools, you need to learn from mistakes and, and don't be sloppy. So look at the issues they've raised and make sure in the future you don't, in, you don't make the same mistake again. Um, type in everything. Put type hints on everything. And where you can't do it at language level, do it in the dot blocks. Uh, create um, or use plugins or stubs to give extra information about static analysis tools. A lot of these static analysis tools, people have already written stub files or what they've already written plugins that give additional information uh, that's required. So before you do your own, just check on Packagist or Google it to see if someone else has already done the work. And you can use uh, tools um, that help fix issues like Salter and Rector. And then you get to this question, do you really expect me to fix all these bugs? Uh, the answer is no, create a baseline. And that was discussed um, by Rob, so I'm going to wrap up now, uh, but I'll just go down to the summary. I did actually write a baseline at all, um, and since writing it, both Psalm and uh, PHP uh, Stan have now got their own baseliners, so people used to use mine, but now nobody does. Uh, I know. Right, so in summary, oops, in summary, Appropriate application of static analysis reduces the overall cost of software development. And my hope is that I've gone some way to convincing you that that is, that is the case. And the way we do it is essentially we're trying to find bugs earlier. So our real-time static analysis helps us prevent introducing bugs in the first place, and our CI is acting as a safety net. If you do not have tools, if you do not have this absolute base minimum, then tomorrow, next time you're in, add this in. Um, and if you're not using uh, a real-time static analysis tool, an IDE, then I would uh, recommend investigating one and using one, and you can always use uh, PHP Storm. And if you haven't got PHP Storm, then leave some feedback, and you might win one. <laughs> and then definitely use your advanced static analysis tools in CI, 
in the last year, they've added baselining. There's no reason really not to. Uh, I've been Dave Lidiment, uh, work for Lamp Bristol. Thank you for listening. <laughs>